Good morning and welcome. I'm John Drew and I will be serving as your worship associate this morning. It's a special morning, Mother's Day. A uh, special greeting to all those mothers, biological, foster, adoptive mothers, all women who are caregivers of our children of, of the world. Thank you very much. Special welcome. Those of you participating in the internet, if you have your chalice or candle, have it handy so you can light, our, light your chalices together at, with us at the appropriate time. Uh, for those here, please silence your little cell phones. Anyone need a listening device? If so, uh, raise your hand and the ushers will bring one to you. Okay? The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Diego is an inclusive community that encourages free thinking, compassionate living. We gather here to consider the most significant issues in life and to make manifest in this world the beloved community of all souls. We welcome and affirm all people of all ages, abilities, races, ethnicities, gender identities, sexual orientations, family structures, etc. If you are visiting today for the first time, we would like to get to know you. If you're feeling comfortable, please stand and give your name and where you come from. Any visitors today? No, any visitors today? No, okay. All right. Any visitors on the internet? Welcome to you. All right? Okay. We are an active congregation, many ways to keep informed, our newsletter, website, weekly order of service. If you wish to know more about the UU Fellowship, we encourage all of you, especially those of visitors here at home, to go to our website, uufsd.org, to get more information, and if desired, sign up for the weekly newsletter to get more info about what's going on. Okay. Our pastoral committee is also here for you. Email pastoralcare at UUFSD, providing contact information, and if you feel comfortable, state what your needs are or how we must may best be able to respond to you. Also, your UUFSD communication committee on Thursday sent out a dialogue asking, what now? was sent to your email, should have been on Thursday. If you didn't get it, then uh, uh, send an email to office at UUFSD. And it's really simple. I did it yesterday. It took only about three minutes or something like that, okay? Uh, get it done by the 22nd of May. So we can, we can know what everybody wants to going on in the service, in the, in the church, congregation. We come together. To commit to reaffirm our commitment as community and our UU principles that guide us in living a moral and ethical life. Welcome. We are glad you are all here today to help that reaffirmation. Please, everyone, stand in body and or in spirit and use a minute or two to say hello to those around you. I'll ring a bell when it's time to come back. Oh, yes, I the bell, bro. All right, ding, 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 ding. Yeah, you stay standard <laughs> for our gathering hymn. Gathering him is him 347, Gather the Spirit. If you had, all right, everybody's right in body and spirit. Right.
Our worship today is the words from Janet Rebham from her treatise Finding Tranquility Base. I searched among her crayons for a color that represented autumn and pulled out an orange tone crayon, never used. It read bittersweet, and I wondered why that particular name. Autumn was my favorite time of the year. I was always ready for the change. I guess some people didn't see it that way. Some people wanted to cling to summer. I loved both seasons, but I thought no one would ever call spring better sweet, even though it was just another change, another new cycle, and into one season, the beginning of another, in an endless, never-ending spiral. As a UU congregation, we are guided by the principles of our faith, which calls us to take action to dismantle racism in ourselves and in our institutions, and in order to build a diverse, multiracial, beloved community, to that end, we take the moment to acknowledge the land on which we stand, home of our native people. Uh, Chalice Lightning today, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship Chalice represents our shared history, hope, and commitment to the principles of our faith that joins us together. Those of you at home are now invited to join us in lighting the chalice or candle, holding it to the camera so we can share our light together. I have not told her, but I think today in uh, recognition of who has started this May, um, uh, hence month of uh, mental health, I would like Wenda Harris to light the chalice today. That's what you get for getting involved. <laughs> I'm sitting in the front row, yeah. Right. A, yeah. Mm. 
In the words of Kate McCann, it takes love to hold on when you want to let go. It takes love to let go when you want to hold on. The flaming chalice is a symbol of learning and love. It's our symbol, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. All right, please rise in body and spirit and join us in our centering hymn, Spirit of Life, following, followed by reciting, reciting the covenant. The words to both are in your order of service. There are any uh, young folks or young folks at heart, you can come forward to the intergenerational sharing. Here we go. So this is Instructions from Neil Gaiman. You might have seen the movie uh, Caroline a long time back. You're a little young for that. It was, <laughs> it was only about 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and those who know Neil Gaiman might not think a children's book, but he's done by him. Anyway, so touch the wooden gate in the wall you never saw before. Say please before you open the latch, go through. Walk down the path. Oh, there's a whole mystery, all kinds of mystery characters in this land over here. A red metal imp from the green painted front door as a knocker. <laughs> Isn't it cute? <laughs> Do not touch it though, it will bite your fingers. Oh, how are you supposed to knock on the door then? Walk through the house. Take nothing, eat nothing. You know when you're in somebody's house, you don't say, you know, you don't take things until people say, all right, it's all right. However, if any creature tells you that it's hungers, feed it, that it hungers, feed it. If it tells you that it is dirty, clean it. If it cries to you that it hurts, 
if you can, ease its pain. You know, we try and help others. As others, we want to help us. From the back garden, you were able to see the wild wood. The deep well you walked past leads to winter's realm. Where's that? There's another land at the bottom of it. If you turn around here, you can walk back safely. You will lose no face. You know, if you get scared of new things, you know, you can, you can not do it. Don't have to do it just because others do it. I will think no less of you. Once through the garden, you will be in the wood. The trees are old, eyes peer from the undergrowth. Beneath the twisted oak sits an old woman. She may ask for something, give it to her. She will point the way to the castle. You never know, when you do something for somebody, it might come back to you as something really good. Inside it are three princesses. Do not trust the youngest, walk on. I don't know, somebody says, you know, sometimes there's some people you don't talk to, all right. If an eagle gives you a feather, keep it safe. That, that feather is very precious to that eagle. It came right from its own body. Remember your name. Do not lose hope. What you seek will be found. Okay, remember, always remember yourself. Always remember yourself. When you come back, return the way you came. Favors will be returned. Debts will be repaid. Do not forget your manners. Do not look back. Ride the wise eagle. You now not you shall not fall. There's something you can trust. Some people things you can trust into. Just go with them, okay? Also ride the silver fish. You will not drown. The fish will take care of you. There is a worm at the heart of the tower that is why it will not stand. Interesting. And then go home. Or make a home. Or just rest. Thank you, guys. You want some help? <laughs> All right, we can sing the children out now. <laughs> uh oh, bad children. <laughs> This church is the community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. Please pass the baskets now.
lovely from always lovely from Katie. All right. Many of us have found joy this week. Many of us have felt sorrow. Now is the time for us to express our joys and sorrows amongst our friends here. If you wish to, please come forward as usual. Not a time for announcements. All right. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> I think that's the first. <laughs> We're usually a boisterous congregation. <laughs> All right. Uh, let us enter a time of silence for meditation, reflection, or prayer. By first singing a chant, Meditation on Breathing, the time of silence will end with the sound of the ding. I think that woke you up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always lovely to meditate in this uh, space with uh, the birds singing and all that stuff. I always enjoy it. The reading today is a poem by Wendell Berry. No, no, there is no going back. Less and less you are that possibility you were. More and more you have become those lives and deaths that have belonged to you. You have become a sort of grave containing much that was and is no more in time beloved than now and always. And so you have become a sort of tree standing over the grave. Now more than ever you can be generous toward each day that comes young to dis disappear forever and yet remain unaging in the mind. Every day you have less reason not to give yourself away. Our guest speaker today is Michael Eslam. He serves as a chaplain of Sims Mann UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology. Two-time TEDx speaker, Michael speaks extensively to healthcare professionals, patient populations, and faith communities across the country. He also worked as an activist educator addressing anti-LGBTQ bias in the larger community for over 30 years. Michael was recently inducted into UCLA Semel Institute Eudaimonia Society in recognition of having lived a meaning-driven life. He has four volumes of CDs available for purchase. Contact Michael through his website if you're not in attendance today at michaelslum.com. Good morning. Several years ago, a dear friend and, and colleague at work, Lorelei Bonet, was preparing 
a lecture to give to an upcoming oncology social work conference. What are you going to talk about, Lorelei? Ecotones, she said. I never heard that word before. What? Is that some kind of a retro punk environmental cover band? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the ecotones. No, she went on to explain it's those places in nature that are transitional zones between two adjacent ecosystems or communities, like where a grassland meets a forest or where a river meets the sea. I love that there was a word for these places in nature that fascinate me. She was using it as a metaphor for places that cancer patients sometimes find themselves caught between competing realities. I love as Love it as a metaphor for any of us as we move into life's deeper mysteries, crossing into thresholds, into territories that are neither one thing nor the other, despite all of our need to see it as such. And yet I find it is in those liminal places that perhaps we have the best access to something we might call truth, or maybe even a glimpse of the sacred. In the summer of 2005, I attended a week-long seminar on Cape Cod with Thomas More, the well-known author and psychologist. He's made his life's work a study of the nature of soul. He constructed the workshop in such a way that we only spent a half day together each day because he wanted us to spend the other half a day out on the Cape, letting it work its magic on us, he said. He didn't have to tell me twice. I fell in love with the place particularly the marshes and wetlands, these ecotones that are neither land nor sea, changing moment to moment with the shifting of the tide. That love affair continues to this day, every summer, ever since Scott and I spent a week in Provincetown at the very tip of Cape Cod. And one of my favorite things to do there is to float effortlessly on the incoming or outgoing tide over the marsh. The water is so saline you can float effortlessly, swallowed up into this magical netherworld. A sunrise or a sunset can be a kind of ecotone too, neither light nor dark, neither day nor evening, and yet it is in that transitional time frame where all the most splendid colors, all that awe-inspiring beauty happen. I love the word evening for its unintended implication. It's an evening out of day into night. In February of 2019, three years ago, I took a solo journey across southern India from east to west, go, starting in Cochin, I mean, starting in Chennai and ending in Cochin. The penultimate stop on my itinerary was this teeny village called Mutuvankudi, high in the mountains, the western Ghats of Kerala, not far from the town of Munar. It's a region that's known for tea and spice plantations. I spent two nights at the Ecotones Lodge, if you can imagine. Eight Spartan rooms situated in the most stunning landscape imaginable. One night, I was the only guest at the lodge. When I arrived, I booked two guided walks with a local guide, Vishak. Vishak was 27, bright, curious, friendly, knew everything about every plant, every crop, every insect, everything about every bird in the neighborhood. He had a wanderer's heart himself, and he dreamed of destinations far from Kerala, though he wasn't quite sure he had heard of Los Angeles. I booked my first walk for that afternoon, a spice and culture walk. We walked down lanes and paths, through fields, plantations, through jungles, even getting caught in an afternoon rainstorm talking, talking, talking every step of the way about just about everything. It was an enchanted afternoon. The next morning would be our sunrise walk. He told me he'd pick me up at 5.30. I got up at 5 o'clock. I took an ice cold shower because 10 more minutes of sleep seemed more precious than the slim chances of any hot water. I got dressed and went outside early because my host, C. Joe, had promised me a hot cup of tea before the walk. I stepped out and the super, moon, super full moon was still high in the sky, illuminating the landscape in this eerie, silvery glow, casting moon shadows everywhere. The breathing stillness of the morning, it soothed my spirit. The silence 
the coolness. Thank God Vishak brought a flashlight because we once we went under the canopy of trees, it was so dark you could not see your hand in front of your face. We walked in silence at first. The only sound was the crunch of gravel under our feet. But soon the birds began to awake and would call to one another. And then there was the call to prayer from a local mosque. We walked a bit further and there was a gong and chanting from a Hindu temple. Once we emerged out from under the canopy of trees into the moonlight, we didn't need the flashlight. Vishak took a hard left turn up a steep path, said this way, Michael. We scrambled up over some rocks and boulders and ended up on this enormous plinth of granite, a slab high on this precipice overlooking this amazingly enormous valley, mountains surrounding everywhere. We will wait here for the sun, he said. Okay? Oh, it was more than okay. Emily Dickinson once said, I'll tell you how the sun rose, one ribbon at a time. It wasn't like that for me. I, I was transfixed by the mountains in the moonlight, and they were covered with clouds, creating another kind of ecotone that you couldn't tell where the land ended and the sky began. But soon this pink glow emerged from behind one of the mountains, and this renegade appendage of clouds swirled up in the sky, its edges catching the hidden sunlight. It looked like a fire-breathing dragon, and then it disappeared just as quickly. And then the sun shone itself, and announced the beginning of a new day. We sat there for maybe 40 minutes or so. Soon there was more chanting, men's voices, Latin this time from the Catholic Church down in the valley beneath us. And when they stopped singing, the women began to chant. And then they sang together in this gorgeous harmony. It was an exquisite moment of perfection. Everybody needs this every once in a while, Vishak said. Oh, yes, they do, I said. Vishak, does this ever get old to you? Is this just another day at work? No, I like this, he said. It's never quite the same thing. I felt the oddest combo platter of feelings in that moment. Of course, deep, profound gratitude, but this urgent need to imprint my memory with every sight, smell, color, sensation, not wanting to forget a moment of it, and acutely aware that I will never pass this way again. And of course, that's true of every moment in which we live, isn't it? But somehow it seemed more true on that slab of rock and as one who always seems to want more, I also had this awareness that even with the best of luck, the years left for me are fewer than the years I've had some of the clothes in my closet. So there was a bit of sadness too, and longing for everybody I loved, wishing they could be where, there with me on that rock, especially my mom. But don't get me wrong, the essential feeling was one of deep gratitude and awareness that this moment is enough. This lifetime is enough. More than enough. Vishak, do you know what that word ecotones means, the name of that lodge where I'm staying? Yes, I think. I think it means like eco-friendly, no? No, it actually means a place in nature where two ecosystems adjoin one another, like where the river meets a sea, or where a grassland meets a forest, or where your life, as different as it is, meets my life, here, on this rock, right now. Yes, he said. I wasn't quite sure he understand the depth of my meaning or metaphor, but I knew I had, experiencing, I had experienced something like a holy communion, sacred space in that ecotone. Living with cancer can also be a kind of ecotone caught between competing realities. I walk beside countless patients who struggle with how do I make my decisions going forward? Do I live as if today is my last day or do I live as if I have all the time in the world? What if it's neither and both? And if it's the former, how do I live with that kind of urgency to demand that every moment be so profound and meaningful? And wouldn't that rob me of the pleasures of everyday life, the simplicity of that, the luxury of wasting time? The process of dying is definitely a kind of ecotone, too, caught between life and death, as anyone can tell you who's walked beside a loved one who's dying. 
a process that can take years, watching one slowly slip away by inches, not quite sure how much of that person we loved is even still there, which is even the authentic self. Such was the case for my mom over the last few years of her life as dementia enshrouded her sense of clarity, even her sense of herself in a kind of fog, a fog that would part every now and then, giving us a brief glimpse of the mom we knew and remembered, only to be swallowed up again, until COPD and a return of lung cancer showed her to the final exit. I saw her for the last time on March 30th, 2019, and she died eight days later, April 7th. A year earlier, Mother's Day, 2018, Scott and I went to visit her. She lived on the central coast near Morro Bay. We took her out to lunch in San Luis Obispo, walked around a bit, and then just parked it on a bench there in front of the mission in the main plaza. It was exasperating, yes, to listen to the same closed loop tape of disappointments and frustrations and anger and anecdotes we had heard 10,000 times before. But still, it was a gorgeous day, and it seemed far more pleasant to sit here and have this conversation, if you will, than to sit for endless hours in her mobile home watching HGTV. But just then, an idea from somewhere else altogether plopped into my head. Sixteen years earlier, after my mom had survived lung cancer treatment, I took a couple days off of work, and I went to go visit her to interview her on videotape rather exhaustively. Over the span of two days, we made six hours of tape, which I had never watched. And I just had this idea, Mom, what about going back to your place and let's watch that interview we made 16 years ago? Of course, she had no recollection of the thing or that such a thing even existed, but she was game. Oh, sure, honey, that sounds like fun. Let's do that. My intention was twofold. I wondered what kind of gift might there be for my mom to give her her story back to herself from a different point in life. Might there even be some kind of magic in that? And selfishly, I also wanted to reconnect with that version of my mom I so dimly remembered. And that's not accurate. Of course, I remembered her. I just couldn't connect that version of my mom with this addled, angry, frustrated old woman in front of me. So over that afternoon and evening, we got through four hours of the interview in two sittings. My mom was intrigued, enchanted by the process, but thoroughly frustrated. Now, where was this done and why did we do it? Asking only inches away from where she's seated on the videotape, look, mom, it's the same front doorknob on your front door. But she was enthralled with the woman on the screen. But it's so weird, honey, I know that's me. And I remember these stories when she tells them, but I, I can't quite understand that it's me because she seems so professional-like. I know, I was shocked too. But the hour grew late and she was tired, so we all went to bed. And the next morning she didn't remember anything that the tape existed or that we had sat and watched it. A month later, we went to see her again and watched the last two hours. This would be a far more intense experience. I'd long forgotten that her late beloved Glenn had made a surprise interruption in our interview. It was such a joy to see his smiling, playful self there. Oh, hi, Glenny, my mom howled. I miss you. I did remember that she closed the interview with a tearful valedictory to each of her kids, wanting us to remember above all how much she loved us. To my shock and amazement, the next morning, my mom remembered everything. Wasn't that something last night, she said? I just can't get over it. Thank you, honey. And you know what? It makes me feel like it's not so bad to get old because I just don't care anymore. Everything that mattered so much just doesn't matter anymore, and I feel free. Thank you, honey. The tide had brought her back to me for a moment, and we could float together in that ecotone just for a few moments before she drifted off again. 
but there was definitely a kind of sacredness in that, maybe even a glimpse of the eternal. A few months before she died in February, my sister Terry threw my mom an amazing 90th birthday party, a truly wonderful evening. And shortly after, she declined sharply, and after a few days in the hospital and a few days in rehab, she was sent home on hospice. Just to give my sister a break, who had done all the heavy lifting in my mom's care in recent years, a truly heroic job, I took a couple of days off from work to go take care of my mom, just to relieve Terry. I knew that it would likely be the last time I would ever see her, though she did not. She did not understand that she was on hospice, nor that she would not be getting any better. I, of course, had my expectations of how I wanted that time to be. I wanted to be so fully present and aware and conscious of this, the gravity of this situation, this threshold that we were crossing together. I'm sure it will surprise no one here to know that life doesn't always give us what we want. When she came home from the hospital, she was so confused. While on one hand she knew it was her house, she would ask continuously, was my bedroom always here? Was there always a wall there? Was there always a window there? Was my TV always in the corner? In the oddest way, I was having a parallel experience of disorientation. Is this really my mom? Is this really the last time I'm going to see her forever? And I was present to her as a caregiver, as a chaplain of sorts, but not as her son, exactly. I was so busy tending to the next task, getting the next set of meds ready, getting the next meal ready, answering the same question 3,000 times as patiently as I could, but not present to her in the way that I wanted to be. But still, this day that I had dreaded since I was four years old and the nuns at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in Long Beach explained that we are all going to die, even my mom. Well, that day was here and I wasn't there for it. Not in the way I wanted to be anyway. In the spring of 2006, thanks to my husband, Scott, I took my mom on a one week trip to Spain. We had the best time. We were in Cordoba and we were walking back to the bus stop to catch the bus back to our hotel and there was a bit of chill in the air and we were on the shady side of the street. So I said, Mom, let's cross the street over there on the sunny side, it's probably a little warmer. And just like that, we both broke into spontaneous song. Grab your coat and get your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. There we were singing and dancing our way across the street in Cordoba, Spain. The last afternoon I had with my mom, we were sitting at her kitchen table and I was reminiscing with her about some of the trips we'd gone on together and about that moment in particular. And just like that, she began to sing again and she knew every word of the song and we sang it together. We didn't have the kind of moment I wanted, but we did have that song. The following summer after she died, that August, Scott and I went to Provincetown. I was tucked into the side of a sand dune under a big beach umbrella in the pouring rain, watching the tide come in over the wetland, waiting for it to get deep enough to go float. Like my mom, I'd always loved the rain. That afternoon, I was the only one out on the beach at Herring Cove. Earlier that morning, my brother had sent my sister and me an email. He'd come upon a poem that my mom had written. My mom had always written poetry ever since she was a lovesick teenager as a cashier at the old Egyptian theater in downtown Long Beach, alone in the box office and in life, it would seem. 
From the tone of this poem, I gathered it was before Glenn had come into her life. So maybe she was in her late 50s, mid 60s, roughly my age. She called the poem ageless, and she was reflecting on the serenity that she still felt in the rain. A feeling so vivid, just as vivid as it has been when she was a young girl, leading her to conclude that she is, we are, ageless in a way, at least in the way that we respond to life, the way that we can still let it in. Over the last few years of her life, it was much harder to even discern or recognize that ageless part of her. And now that she's gone, it's hard to know what version of my mom I'm even grieving, which was the authentic self. There I was, nestled into the side of that sand dune, staring at my phone in the rain, reading and rereading that poem, trying so hard to connect to that ageless part. And I just couldn't. My friend Rosa reminded me that a womb is an ageless place, a place that is neither existence nor non-existence, an ecotone, if you will. Michael, what better place could there have been than sitting in that earthly womb of that sand dune in the rain next to a marsh? What better place could there be to contemplate your mother? This mystical bridge between realities, this ecotone, I think can be something one of my patients once called a God moment. A moment in which not much happens, in which the stuff and business of life falls away, just leaving room and space for awareness, for presence, for connection, for an awareness that this moment is all that there is. And it's enough. And it's beautiful. Whether it's floating effortlessly on the incoming tide in Provincetown or admiring a beautiful sunrise on that rock in India with Vishak, or singing a song one last time with my mom. Ageless, yes, perhaps after all, with gold dust at my feet on the sunny side of the street. So be it. Thank you. This mic on? There we go. Of the many condolence messages I received after my mom's death, this one from my friend Buck meant the most. And we lost Buck a year ago, too. He said, I'm sorry to hear about your mother's passing. She was wonderful, and I loved her. I smile thinking of her. She loved you kids and made that clear. I remember one Sunday morning, when she was with you when you spoke in Santa Monica, we sat next to each other talking and joking, always comfortable that way. Then things got underway and we quieted down and I kept an eye on her. She was smiling and looking around at the congregation, listening intently, hungry for what you were saying, connecting. She could tell you had a gift, could communicate your heart and touch other hearts. She leaned, leaned into me and whispered, that's my son up there. And it was set with an equal mix of happiness, wonder, admiration, and great pride. And then at the end, without skipping a beat, she said, I just wish they sang some songs I knew. I loved your mom. So in honor of my mom on Mother's Day, let's sing a song together that she knew.
if the uh, UU urge has gotten to you and your bulletin it talks about tomorrow at nine at three thirty is UU the vote uh, Zoom. We hope to get letters to a thousand people encouraging them to vote. Uh, Emma's revolution will be there. Now we will extinguish the chalice. Uh, please join me in the words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of the community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together. You may be seated. I invite us to perhaps close our eyes and let's take a few nice deep breaths together. And as we sense that energy that passes between us, it connects us in the family of things. We consider again the image of the ecotone, the place between two worlds, a timeless place. May we keep our eyes and hearts open for those mystical places within us. May we float effortlessly in those places and the discover the love that is there for us, ageless love. And may we give it away freely. So be it. I invite us all to close our eyes. Oh, we did that. Oh, we're done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michael.